Love is Blind, and other related series of the franchise created by Nick and Vanessa Lachey think they're doing something smart by asking the question that apparently no one has before, but everyone is dying to see play out in the form of disingenuously curated reality TV. Can you fall in love with someone sight unseen? Yes, we're not starting off very nice today. I have a problem with both the grammar and the conceptual value of the show, which I want to pick apart today, and I'm throwing out all of my biases at you in the first several seconds of this video just so that those who love the show can appropriately prepare their pitchforks and know exactly what they're getting into by choosing to continue to watch this video. Either way, I am so grateful, so happy that you could make it here or make it back from wherever it is on the internet that you happen to drop in from. If you don't know me, nice to meet you. My name is Catherine. And let's be honest, we all know the answer to this question. Of course you can. It's almost too easy. Between dating apps and Discord and the fact that so many of us practically live on social media, a lot of us have built online connections having never met each other in real life. The real question isn't about whether or not love is blind. We know that it is. I propose to you that the true lure of the show, the reason it has such a chokehold on society, is because the real question is about who can reimagine superficial banter and untested intoxication with the stranger's alleged understanding of who you are into a commitment that will withstand the trials of life, bear the complexities of real human beings. I do not watch reality TV, not habitually at least, but like I said, there is a lure and I guess I guess I'm taking the bait. So please sit down, please get comfortable, please get yourself a snack. Do, do whatever it is that you need to do to get yourself as ready for this analysis as possible. But without further ado, I would love to know what you guys think about the things we discussed today. Let's begin. All right, so full transparency, guys. I didn't really know how to structure this video, simply because there are so many tensions, so many reciprocities, and so many controversies to consider. I thought it best to just address the most culturally destabilizing ideas that present within the couples in the show that have the most screen time. Basically, I wanted to focus on what gets most under people's skin. All right, so I'm going to first start off by introducing you to the rather impressive mess of a situation that was Sam, Nicole, and Benaya from Love is Blind UK season one. If you haven't watched the series, I'm going to try to describe the most pertinent aspects of their expression as obviously curated by reality TV, so that the principles I highlight in this discussion Discussion can be appreciated universally. Sam31 is a product design manager. From the beginning, there was something about him that gave me a strange type of pause, and I kept watching the show and trying to understand what exactly it was. But one is immediately conscientized and to some degree overwhelmed by his urgency to present himself as honest, authentic, sincere, and non-superficial. He speaks with this appreciable vulnerability about how his insecurities about weight, general lack of self-esteem, and anxieties around women have informed his glow up, his look smacks era, although I don't know how he looked before this. Sam, in my opinion, in, again, in my opinion, embodies many a frustration with the prototypical nice guy, a male with no subtlety to say the right words, impress the right assurances according to what informs his understanding of what behaviors are most guaranteed to secure him a match, and he is desperate to secure a match. His authenticity is very compensatory, but for his own sake, it's compensatory to what esteem deficits I think exist within him. And so he performs, he says the right words, and he does everything that he is more desperate to experience than the subject of that affection. In the parts, he was so psychologically destabilized when, you know, in his excitement, he said to Nicole that he was going, when they saw each other in person, he was going to pick her up. And then Nicole jokingly says, well, I, I, I don't think you'll be able to do that. I mean, the mere possibility that Nicole could be overweight when he had previously been overweight, I think there's an insecurity so severe that he can't even tolerate it in a person that he is supposed to be attracted to. Yet, he spent the whole, the entirety of the previous three, four episodes convincing me, convincing you, convincing anyone that will listen, that he doesn't give a damn about appearance. It's about what's on the inside, right? But for the fact that Nicole could, might be overweight, he is so disturbed. He is so 
bothered. And it is definitely telling to what it might be brewing inside of him. Unfortunately, I can't speak to the veracity of what happened when Nicole and Sam actually met. And Nicole apparently wanted to be intimate with Sam according to his narrative and he, he said no. That by his understanding, which obviously I can't not validate, is what pushed Nicole away. But what I can definitely say is that Nicole immediately, and I mean immediately upon seeing Sam for the first time, sense that some, some, something was off. Compensatory authenticity is so pungent and it is harder to hide when you are in person. Human beings, unfortunately, and I, as I have learned the hard way, uh, human beings are terribly sensitive to how intolerant you are to your own loneliness, but also how much of your expression you've contrived to kill that reality. It is, it, 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 it just, it's like smell. People can sense insecurity. And I think Nicole sensed something disingenuous about Sam. But again, that is just my interpretation. I want to move on to the next couple. And I think this is the couple that re really pulled the emotions within me. I want to pivot to Catherine and Freddie. And I think this dynamic in particular really frustrated me. How conscientized I was to how ideologically burdened certain securities, certain protections to one's financial future have become in the modern age. I was also disturbed and honestly humbled for how punishing our reservations can be as women to guys who don't deserve it. Freddie did not deserve any aspect to how Kat treated him after she realized that he had cheated in a previous relationship. Not because her apprehensions having been cheated on before were not understandable, not because she, you know, clearly had an abandonment complex having been adopted, not, not because that those aren't significant enough, you know, anxiety inducing factors, but because in my opinion that punishment was never hers to give and i genuinely feel like kat was very much aware of this herself and that is why she apologized to freddie eventually i truly do believe that kat decided to treat him with congruence to the appropriate intolerance coldness and suspicion that she felt was deserving of a cheater even though she, he never cheated on him he, he'd done nothing wrong but because she'd asked if he'd ever cheated in a relationship and he was honest he was vulnerable he said well Yes, this obviously triggered something inside of her having, you know, been in relationships where she'd been cheated on and she now felt it appropriate to punish him with her attitude, with her coldness. His playful idiosyncrasies, you know, became an irritant to her and as somebody who struggles with over-intellectualizing things, I have come to realize that when a guy is unserious, when he is playful, when he takes pleasure, you know, in being just deeply annoying, it's actually not a bad thing at all. It's something you need to preserve within him because it means energy brings him down to that ease of childlike comfortability. I'm just not convinced that it means a guy is immature because he doesn't want to discuss the most pressing and concerning things of the day immediately all the time because we're all different and for example okay for me after a very long day this happened the other day I, I had a terrible day I just I was I was in a bad mood and my dad comes up to me he knocks on my door and this is Catherine what do you think of the Palestinian response to Netanyahu since October 7th and I kid you not guys I was I was in a terrible mood but the way the way the law I came back into my eyes because this is the type of thing I like to talk about. I don't like to joke around. I don't like to beat around the bush. I want to talk about the most pressing, the most serious things of, of the day. And, and those things don't give me anxiety. But if I have a partner who wants to joke around with me and be playful and for him being serious and teasing me is just the way that he connects and bonds with me, then wh 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 why be irritated about it? He's happy. He's comfortable enough around me. So well, I... I just, I, I'm, I just don't get it. Freddie joking around and teasing Kat wasn't a sign that he didn't care. It wasn't a sign that he was immature. Rather, it was a sign that he was that comfortable around her. And her then being cold, being critical, being honest, honestly being mean. I felt, I felt so bad for Freddie because he didn't deserve it. I think it was because Kat, I think, didn't know how to handle the weight that, okay, the person that I'm with has cheated before in a relationship. How can I trust them? But Freddie hadn't done anything wrong to her. He had been a complete angel and, and I just don't think that he, he deserved all of that. The other thing, and this is what really got under my skin, was the conversation about the prenup. Now, after all of the insecurity that Kat had now piled up at the front of Freddie's mind, I honestly do not blame him for having reservations about the woman he's known for no more than a few weeks 
possibly taking everything that he's worked for for his entire life in the event that he dies. Oh, and then that decision by Kat's friends being essentialized to some androcentric complex that is always too masculine, too controlling, too toxic. I mean, that was just so ridiculous to me. Like these are the absurd connections that I think make guys, the, the genuine guys, look at us sideways because who honestly has the patience for such a profound clownery, I, I don't know. I, I just found it to be such a reach and to be so unfair. But you know, again, that's just my opinion. Moving on. All right, I think I think it's out of my system now, but the last thing I want to speak to is maternal enmeshment. And this was really significant in the relationship between Jasmine and Bobby, particularly on Jasmine's side, because her mother had been through so many toxic relationships, so just, just been through too many problematic men that she imposed her anxieties and her insecurities on her daughter. Oh, this woman, Jasmine's mother, demanded such like every intimate detail of her daughter's romantic life, like everything that was in no way her business. She demanded this because she was so anxious that, oh gosh, what if my daughter goes through the same thing as me? I need to make sure that she is with a man who respects her and treats her well. Like all of the stuff that she, she became so unhealthily immersed and involved with her daughter's romantic life. Jasmine now has had so many relational instabilities with men that she has found herself on Lovers Blind. So really, how helpful has her mother been? Jasmine's mother did not support the wedding. She did not like Bobby. But I think for the fact that Jasmine was able to just detangle herself from the weight of her mother's anxieties, that is something of adult maturity that I, I always love to see. What happens when you associate part of your decisions with somebody else's motivations? You start to resent them when things go wrong. And then when things go right, you start depending on this person's decisions and motivations and influences whatever those may be, for guaranteed positive outcome in your own life. And that is also equally unhealthy. We're adults here, right? We need to take responsibility for who we believe will protect us. And you know what? I'm glad that Jasmine decided to believe Bobby when he said, I love you, I will protect you. And she got married. I don't know where they are now. I look, the reunion <laughs> might prove all of my points are wrong and look, I'm just going by what the show has presented as of right now. But my point is, irrational skepticism never helped anyone. And I'm just glad that, you know, Jasmine was able to realize that. So I have been talking for a really, really long time and I'm sure that you're tired as well. This video has been long enough. As per usual, I'm so grateful and so happy that you could join me today. I really do hope to see you next time. You please, please, please take care and have a lovely, lovely rest of your day. I will see you whenever it is that next time happens to be. You take care and goodbye.